¿Cómo vamos? ¿Quién tiene un negocio que esté funcionando en este momento? ¿Quién está planeando un negocio? Okay, muy bien. ¿Quién ha tenido un negocio que ha fracasado? Okay. ok, entonces tratemos de tener una conversación en los siguientes 30 minutos. I'm going to switch to English now and let's try to have a conversation in the next um, 30 minutes. And one of the challenges that we have is that we usually don't talk about difficult subjects. Okay? It's very, very complicated to acknowledge that we have difficulties. Okay? And in our Latin culture, especially so. We, we tend to punish failure, what we think is failure. So if things don't go as we plan, we feel embarrassed. There is another big issue for us. We don't collaborate with each other. And I think if there is only one thing I could share today in terms of what we should be doing better as a, as a community is Uh, to join forces. We think we need to do it alone. Yeah? And other communities collaborate much more. The Jewish community, the Irish community, the Italian community, the Korean community, the Chinese community, they collaborate more. Somehow, we haven't managed to understand that together we are better off. So I'm a professor at the university, but when I came to Canada in 1995, uh, I had four medical specialties and two doctorates, two children. My wife and I came and I was offered $24,000 a year to live. And my wife was not allowed to work. It was very difficult. We were planning to go back to England um, after a year and decided to stay here. It was very difficult. And the thing that helped us most was to join forces with others. But we found it much easier to collaborate with non-Hispanic or Latin people than with our own people. Okay? So I could stop by saying, how can we survive and thrive? By working together. Okay? Because this is not easy. Um, I'm going to compare, I'm a doctor, I'm going to compare uh, a business uh, to a human being. Okay. Businesses are conceived, okay. and, and it's usually a, a, a pleasant thing to come up with an idea for a business. It's very rare that we suffer with a new idea. Usually when we get a new idea, it's great. Okay. Lots of pleasure there. What we tend not to acknowledge is that this is what happens to most ideas. Okay? They die, and they die soon. So most of us have had to deal with the death of an idea that we valued very much. And we tend not to talk about this. And in many cases, this is like losing a family member losing a baby. Okay. And a lot of people who are now employed in offices, in companies, are doing it not because they want to do it, it's because that's the best option they have. And they had ideas that died before they could see the light of day. Okay. So we need to acknowledge that most of us have experienced a lot of pain And, and I think that we need to open spaces to talk about this. Then those ideas that manage to mature end up being born. And just like having a baby, in most cases, this is exhausting and exciting. Because this is a desired baby. I mean, we don't go through this process as an entrepreneurs unless we want to do it. And, and this is tiring, very, very tiring. And then we think that once we incorporate a company, that's where most of the uh, 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 challenges end. And, and in countries like Canada, which has one of the best survival rates, our chances 
of having a business that would reach its fifth year is 50%. How many people here would have a baby knowing that one of out two, one out of two babies would be dead before the fifth birthday? Raise your hands. If we knew that 50% of our children would die before the age of five, would we have children? Yeah. And yet we go and create enterprises. And everybody tells us, we have this support, we have that support, innovate, be an entrepreneur. Okay? And there is very little support for those of us who decide to start businesses, see them being born, and then have to cope with the death. We have to deal with that loss on our own. And this is horrible. I think we need to have more support okay, for the face when we have to close a business. My wife and I have had to close many. The only way in which we survived here was by creating our own businesses. My wife decided not to go back to the lab. She's a biochemist. Uh, she's trained at the top university in Colombia. She had to re-qualify in England where we lived for five years. We came here and the story was the same. You have to take the exams again. You have to train again and all that. So we made the decision to, to be entrepreneurs. And it hasn't been easy. We have lost at least five children. And we have very little support for this. So somehow together we need to figure out a way to give each other love and, 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 to, and to be there for each other when these babies cannot mature. I, I had the opportunity to speak to a big uh, uh, group in Colombia and I realized that in my native country, I'm Colombian, Canadian, the average lifespan of a small company is 12 years. The average age. And for a large company, 18 years. Okay. And I don't have clear data from Canada, but the latest figures we have is that more companies die every year than the number of companies that get created, that are born every year in Canada now. Okay. This is not easy stuff. And we need to acknowledge it. This is hard. And most of us have to do it because the circumstances of a country like Canada are not very pleasant to us as newcomers, as immigrants. Okay? We have the highest rates of poverty. Our children have the highest rates of poverty in Canada. Children of new immigrants in Canada are poorer than children of First Nations or children with disabilities. And we are the generation with the greatest level of education that has arrived in this country. Canada is not a welcoming country for highly qualified people. I have said that on television. They ask me, what would you say to people wanting to come to Canada? I say, don't come unless you have a job already or unless you are very rich or unless you are able to do something that people in Canada cannot do or you are prepared to do something that Canadians don't want to do. We don't talk about this stuff. There is a lot of bullshit out there. And then we end up blaming ourselves because we think we are not doing something right. There is a lot of talk about supporting us. There is a lot of support, of, a lot of talk about opportunities. The opportunities really are not there. So we need to join forces and support each other if we are going to survive and if we are going to enjoy this. And then if we manage to survive, we have to deal with big animals. And there is a small boys club in this country, like in any other country. People support each other from a very early age. Okay? And we are second or third class citizens in this country. We are really not first class citizens yet. Okay? So we either join forces or we will become like the Hispanic community in the U.S. Perceived as underdeveloped people for the rest of our lives and treated like inferior creatures. 
Yeah. And then the risks continue. The business is starting to have strength and then our lives go out of the window. Okay? There is no time for ourselves. We're on email, on WhatsApp, on the telephone all the time. Our kids start to get neglected. And we are starting to see okay, the, the big price coming. And, and very easily, our dreams start to become nightmares. The life of an entrepreneur is not an easy one. We tend to see on television the successful cases. This is hard stuff. Painful. The biggest cause of disability now in the world is depression. Related to what we do for work. When I started medical school, it was a cold. Gripa. The main cause of disability. People saying, I, I cannot work today. When I finished medicine, it was back pain. Now it is depression. Stress-related problems. Anxiety. And very, very, very few of us will make it. Very, very, very few. Okay. The challenge for us is that we think we are going to be one of the very few. It's like people who get married. We say, hey, the, the, the divorce rate, the separation rate is 60%. Hey, I'm going to be okay, in the 40%. Nobody gets married thinking that he or she will get divorced. You ask in a room, who is here above, as a driver above average? Most people raise their hands. It's impossible. We cannot all be above average. Hmm? So we need to acknowledge that the game is rigged. The system is designed for us to fail and to become slaves and work for others who have the capacity to make their dreams happen. And that's what most people with unemployment are doing right now. Most people who are working for a paycheck are working for somebody else who is making his or her dreams happen. And that's what most failed entrepreneurs end, working for somebody else. Adding to the high levels of depression that we are facing. And I'm going to show you some data. This is horrifying. The system is designed to allow a few to accumulate most of the money. In Canada, the Thompson family and the Weston family, two families, own more money than 12 million Canadians. Two families have more money than 30% of Canadians. The system is designed to enable a few, and these are white men. Being a woman is very tough. And being a woman entrepreneur, even tougher. There is no gender equity. Okay. The number was over 60 last year. Two years ago it was 80. This year they adjusted the figures. Eight people have more money than three and a half billion. The game is rigged. These people don't want us to be successful entrepreneurs. And the government is usually in bed with the corporations and with the financial sector to screw us up. So we need to demand through accountability from our politicians. Whose interests are you serving? My interest as a member of the public or the interest of the corporate sector? The big players. So if we're going to survive and thrive, we need to be committed politically. We need to punish those who let us down. And in our own countries, we keep complaining about corruption and all that stuff. Yeah? And how difficult it, gets is, it is to get access to capital is the same everywhere. So the financial sector is, is part of this triangle that is making our lives more difficult. And in a country like Canada, we are at the limit. Most families are maxed out in terms of their debt. Okay. And this is very stressful because there is no mercy. You don't pay, you lose whatever you have. 
No mercy. And what happens when the banks fail? We bail them out. As it happened in the US. When we fail, nobody bails us out. Yeah. And the debt is a problem not only at the individual level, but at the collective level. Ontario is broke. This city is broke. This is the debt of Ontario. Look at that. What does it mean? It means that we are the region in the world with the highest debt in the world, in the world. Our per capita debt is twice the debt of California. And like in the US, we are creating a generation of slaves through student debt. Education should be free for students in a country like this. Nobody should pay for university. Our students are becoming as indebted as the students in the US. So we are forcing a generation which we have cheated already. We lied to our young people. We said, if you study hard, if you do everything right, you're going to be okay. Most of our children are coming now out of school and they have no options. And they will have even less options. Look at this. This is horrible. We don't talk about this stuff. And I think we need space to talk about these things. And please feel free to interrupt me. Okay. And then the most successful business in the world is present here, there, and everywhere. This is the most successful business in the world now. In my field, in 2009, e-health, there was a scandal because $1 billion had been basically stolen. Now, in the year 20, 2017, $8 billion, and nothing happens. In my field, according to some analysts, the most corrupt city in the world is London, England. That's where most of the crooks are concentrating now. And then Canada and the US are trying to compete with all these tax shelters to attract all this dirty money that is trying to, to hide from um, controls by their own governments. So we are starting to see how our society is becoming more and more vulnerable by people who are trying to take bypasses and get away by breaking the rules that then we are all forced to follow. Yeah. And then the big ones, the big ones, the big successful entrepreneurs can afford to invest money in technology, robots, and artificial intelligence. And they only like humans if the humans are their clients. They don't like employees because they go maternity leave, or they unionize, or they get sick, or they're not dependable. Okay? There is an estimate that shows that at least 50% of jobs in North America are not needed. There is a sociologist, David Graeber, check him, from the US. He had to leave for the UK because he was making people uncomfortable at university. He wrote an article called Bullshit Jobs. He says that 75% of jobs in North America are bullshit. People are just pushing paper from one place to the other, checking boxes, supervising others. We are replaceable. And we are being replaced. And we call this, to a large extent, the sharing economy, the sharing economy. The only people who actually share are the owners of these companies. Uber, I'm taking Uber, okay, in different parts of the world, and I talk to people, they are professionals, people who went to university most of the time, having to drive either to make a living or to complement whatever they make in their day jobs. 
And there is no sharing. Sharing of what the driver makes, 25% goes to you, Uber. But there is no driver to driver communication. There is no interest from companies like this to get the drivers to work with each other and improve their lives. Okay. And here we are trying to be entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs and doing it on our own. Big mistake. We are dead. Unless we join forces and say, how am I going to support you? How are you going to support me? How are we going to join forces? This is going to be even more painful. So it is essential, essential to press the pause button and breathe. We need to be urgently patient. Urgently patient. What kind of life do we want? What price are we prepared to pay? How are we going to play this game? Well, because we are not playing it well. We are replicating here the problems of our own countries. And we are missing a big opportunity. Because if there is one that this country offers, it's the opportunity for us to rethink how we live our lives and how we do things. So how could we enjoy full lives as an entrepreneur? How could we get away by going down this path and have a happy, healthy, loving life where we don't burn out, where we don't lose what we have? That's a big question. So we need to recognize that we have the capacity to believe pretty much anything. If we believe that this is valuable, we can believe anything. A note, a bank note, has no intrinsic value. Jewelry has no intrinsic value. I could not eat gold. I cannot eat a $50 bill. I cannot eat. We had to agree that that has value. Okay? And we have agreed so clearly that we are prepared to sacrifice our lives for this. Okay, so if we can believe anything, then let's imagine that we are characters in a movie because we also believe things when we go to the movies. We go to a theater, we sit there, sometimes with popcorn. We know we are in a theater, we are sitting there, there is a screen. We bought the ticket. And then within 10 minutes, we are horrified. We are scared if it is a horror movie. We are crying if it is a romantic one. We are intrigued if it is a mystery one. So what if we imagine our lives like a movie? What kind of movie would we like to experience? What is worth believing? And this was a very important question for my family. We sat down with our children who grew up in Canada and all of them decided to leave. None of our children are here. They are thriving in other countries. Okay. My wife and I are wondering if we should stay here or not. And we are prepared to give it our best shot. And I have all the awards that anybody in my field can earn, can tell you. But I call Canada the land of insurmountable opportunities. We are the only example that the world has now of a post-national environment. I'm Colombian-Canadian and still proud of it. We are still, still is the key word living in harmony. We are not killing each other yet. Europe was the big dream for humanity after the US. Now the Europeans are killing each other and they are fragmenting again. We are it. Toronto is the most diverse city in the world. What the heck are we doing with the diversity we have here? We are squandering it. Okay. 
Okay? So, we decided to be characters in a love story in our family. We don't talk about love very often in our professional lives. We talk about love in our personal lives. But what if love is truly the answer? Because creating a company, running a company, being an entrepreneur is an act of love. We need to love a lot to go through it. And by love, I mean, something, uh, Thomas Aquinas said, to love is to will good. So we need to begin by wishing good. Love has to do with goodness. Yeah. And most of us, most of us would acknowledge the greatest commandment. And the greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And this is present in almost every culture. Do to others what you want them to do to you, for example. What we tend to forget as entrepreneurs is that to love others, or like as people, as members of society, is that the only way to love others is by loving ourselves. So if my first big message of the day is that we should join forces because the game is rigged and unless we join forces we are dead. The second is that we need to love ourselves more. And this is not selfishness. We need to protect ourselves first. And we tend not to protect ourselves. We tend to sacrifice ourselves as entrepreneurs because of my children, because of this, because of that, and we leave ourselves last. Okay. So what if we loved ourselves first? What if we truly believed what we hear on airplanes? And I understood this when I was sitting on an airplane after my wife had been nagging me for years, saying, you need to look after yourself better, Alex. I said, no, 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 my patients are first, my students, my team members, blah, 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 the family. She said, you need to protect yourself first. And then I was on an airplane and they say, if there is trouble, masks will descend. And what do they say? Put your own mask on first. They don't say, if you have a baby, protect your baby first. Hmm? Put your own mask on first. So this is my second big message today. Put your own mask on first first. And what does it mean? What do you need to protect at all costs? What is not negotiable for you? And what is not negotiable for you is what gives you the greatest amount of pleasure. Another big challenge for us with a Christian background. Or most Abrahamic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. For us, pleasure is a sin, usually. But pleasure is the only weapon we have to block fear. And fear is the opposite of love. And the only way in which we can conquer our fears is by enjoying what we're doing. Yeah. The astronomers have another way to call this. Because to be well, we need to be aligned. We need to be coherent. And astronomers call the alignment of planets CCG one of my favorite words in English. In Spanish, sisigia, sisigi. That means the alignment of the planets. So to put our masks on first means that we need to figure out what we would like to feel most of the time. What is that feeling that you would like to experience most of the time? To me, not to know. I love not to know, really. My ignorance is my main source of joy, not knowing mystery. Uncertainty makes me very happy. For my wife, mandar. <laughs> okay, to boss us around. And we know, so she's the boss. I'm the one who has questions. Hmm? She says to organize. She'll be sitting here, she'll say, organize. Okay. So once we figure out what we would like to, to, to feel most, then the challenge is how to make sure that what we do reflects that. 
as I said in my case, what makes me happy is what, what tickles my soul more than anything else is not to know. So I figured out a way yeah, to spend most of my time asking questions. And they even give me awards for my ignorance. This is fascinating. Okay. So how could we align what we do with what we would like to feel? And that should be our compass in our lives as entrepreneurs. Okay. And that requires a little bit of patience and to give ourselves permission to figure that one out because it's usually invisible. We need to make visible the invisible. And this is an important invisible thing that we need to make more apparent. If we don't figure this out, then we are shooting blind. And then, almost to conclude, I would like to quote Anthony de Mello. Anthony de Mello was a, a, a Jesuit priest who was from Goa in India, and he died a few years ago. And after death, his students found a lot of writings and he was writing parables. And these parables were conversations between masters and disciples. And this is my favorite. A disciple asked the, the master, what is love? And the master says, the total absence of fear. This is why I'm emphasizing love. Because if an entrepreneurship is an act of love, we need to conquer fear. Fear is our enemy, and this requires teamwork, and this requires pleasure. Pleasure conquers fear. And then the disciple asked the master, what is that that we fear most? And the master said, love. And the love we fear most is the love to ourselves. Okay, so the time has come for us to start to start loving ourselves and to and by doing that we need to understand and we need to spend time thinking about what would we do if we had no fear? What do we fear most? There are five sources of fear, five, the big ones. First one, fear of death. And that was my big one. So I staged my own funeral. for my 50th birthday. My family gave me a coffin as a present. I wanted to have a big, big funeral. I'm a doctor. I help people at the, you see, I'm, I'm their companion to live as much as possible in the last stages of their lives. So I staged my own funeral. I spent three years asking for forgiveness from people I had hurt and thanking people who had helped me. My kids told me everything they had to tell me. My wife too. I told them everything. I have nothing left unsaid. And they helped me come out, out of the they helped me come out of the coffin and we made a commitment that I would come out with no fear. So I can love fully. And now I'm dividing my life and this is my last suggestion of the day. Let's try to stop let's try to stop trying to predict the future. And let's try to stop living in the future. It's okay to think about the future. The big mistake is to live in the future. And fear comes from the future. And when we are afraid, we cannot love. When we love, we cannot be afraid. So I decided to, to spend the rest of my days in chunks of one hour each. And I call them life units. And we support for many people. This, is, this cannot be done alone. My deal now is to try to live each hour in such a way that if I had the opportunity to relive it an infinite number of times, I would say yes. And that's what Nietzsche, the philosopher, challenged us to do. He said, live your life as if you were going to live it an infinite number of times. Okay. So, what if we let the beauty of what we love guide what we do is the big question. And to answer it, we need to figure out what we love most in ourselves. Not my family, not my children, not my country, not my husband, not my wife. What do I love? 
more than anything else in me. And then once we figure that out and protect that, we'll be much better equipped to do it for everybody else. And thank you for your comment. And I'm going to quote a Chilean superhero. His name is Max Neff, N-E-E-F. He doesn't like to be called Neff. Max Neff, he's in his 80s. And there is a wonderful video on YouTube from a lecture he gave in Andalusia, the International University of Andalusia. And the segment is called Advice You Would Give to Young People. Priceless. He apologizes for having said to a lot of people, you need to know what you want to achieve in life and you need to work hard to achieve it. He said, I apologize for that. I should have said the following. Going through life is like surfing. We need to avoid what he calls the obsession of the fixed point. If we say, that's where I want to go, that point, that point, and then we make efforts to get to that point, we are doomed. He says, it's like surfing. We need to set the direction of the shore. I want to go in that direction. Hmm? And then adjust all the time, adjust all the time, adjust all the time. Okay? And make sure we are directionally right, avoiding that. So when company says, our objective for growth is 3.4%, I said, poor people, they are going to suffer the rest of the year. Okay? And people start cheating, people start doing incredible things, killing themselves to try to get that bloody number. When what we should do is, how can we have the best possible life without hurting other people? And let's try to do it together and adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. And then thinking, what is the worst that can happen? And trust me, if you really think about the worst that can happen, it's not as horrible as we think. Because the second biggest fear after death is failure. But we don't stop to think about what failure means. I'm afraid of failing. Yeah, but what does it mean? And how can we make failure irrelevant? It is possible to make failure irrelevant. The third biggest fear is vulnerability. Physical vulnerability, this is my greatest fear now. To have a stroke, half of my body paralyzed and unable to, to, to speak. And having somebody wipe my ass because I cannot clean my poo, poo and I cannot commit suicide. That's my biggest fear now. So if I collapse, don't call 911. <laughs> what we doctors don't tell you is that less than 2% of people actually survive well. Okay? The fourth biggest fear is embarrassment. We don't want to be ridiculed. Okay. And the fifth one is to disappoint other people. And there are many others, but these are the five big ones. Okay. Yo creo que esto es un ejemplo de precisamente una actividad que va en esa dirección. Y el hecho que estamos aquí, claro, yo estoy aquí en este momento porque creo en la importancia de esto y además tengo dinero. En, en la Universidad de Toronto creamos un fondo. At the University of Toronto, we build a fund. I'm the director of an institute now across the university. And the main reason I'm there is that we have $2 billion a year invested in a piece of infrastructure that is mostly wasted. The work we do at the university is mostly wasted. Okay? We are not connected to society. We are spending most of our time certifying people, publishing papers that nobody reads, and giving awards to each other. Okay? So we need to renovate the university. So, of course, so I, I direct this institute and we decided to put 40% of the budget of the institute in projects that would support young student entrepreneurs in collaboration with the community. And we are trying to mobilize faculty members from the university and partners from around to see if we can facilitate the transformation of ideas into social change. Futurepreneur, I was happy to see that they're opening this. We have Enterprise Toronto. We have pockets of resources that we need to somehow harness together. So yes, the answer is yes, 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 yes. This is why I'm here. In fact, I came from a trip in South America to be here at this meeting today. I'm glad it helped you <laughs> overcome your fears. So.
Okay, thank you. Um, uh, she's just thanking me for a presentation at the right time for her. And I really, it's an act of love. I said, how do I present this? Okay. And this is the first time I do it and probably the last one. If I have to do it again, I hope to learn from, from your feedback. Luz, Dari. Una pregunta más. I'm wondering, how do you suggest that we help each other, you know, beyond today, mm -hmm. like within, within the community? Okay. First, by acknowledging that we welcome support. And two, by making it visible. As I said, if I collapse here, don't call 911. I'm making something visible. What makes me happiest is not to know. I'll be delighted to deal, help you deal with a challenge that is full of uncertainty. You would make me happy if you create the opportunity for me not to know something, because I know how to ask questions. That's about the only thing I know how to do well. Okay? What makes you happiest? And what challenge are you facing now for which you would need support? Let's make it visible now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, why not? So think about it while we go for that. But this is the beginning. No, not too much pressure. This is why we are here. We are in this together. So think about it. Said whoever is willing to help with this or give me support, come and talk to me during the break. That's the beginning. And we need to have it as clear as possible. Yes, please. I, I was very impressed about the comment you made about um, giving support for when you fail. Um, so I wanted to draw the question to you, but also maybe some, someone in the audience that has known of any initiative about supporting entrepreneurs that have failed in that journey to get to the next one, because that's the life of an entrepreneur, as you, as you mentioned. So what is out there to have in mind when you're going to the downhill uh, to lift you up? Okay. Uh, anybody knows of any initiative, at least in town or available online, to support failed ventures and failed entrepreneurs? Raise your hand. Okay. So I think we need to spend time looking for it so we avoid reinventing the wheel. But if we cannot find something, and I would set a date, yes, please. There's an initiative called Fuck Up Nights. <laughs> yeah, that's the name. Uh, for startups, entrepreneurs that they failed. And I'm sure there's, there's a, another initiative, I think it's in Colombia or something, that uh, they try to get together people to talk about failure and what happened and try to learn. But maybe you can start with that, that one. <laughs> yeah, and probably what we may want to do as an outcome of meetings like this is to create a support group. Yeah. And to and, and and at the university we created an event in which the main the only requirement to attend was to be willing to talk about the failure. Because it's very embarrassing. And if we believe Facebook, everybody has a perfect life. That's another big challenge in the age of social media. And social media is making our lives difficult. Everybody seems so happy there. How could I be so miserable? Okay. So so we need to start opening that kind of spaces and, and I'll be more than happy to contribute to such an effort. I think we need closeness. We need the cuerpo a cuerpo. We need the hug. We need the hand holding. We need the call to somebody who can get us, get out of the hole. And we need to use virtual tools as the second best option. So fuck up nice is the name. Is it in person support? Is there something in Toronto? Yeah, that, that's Do they right. have? Yeah, it's, uh, it runs around 50 countries, so it's pretty, pretty big. Okay, brilliant. And there's uh, Entrepreneurs Anonymous as brilliant. well, but I don't know about that one. <laughs> it's in Toronto, fuck up nice. Brilliant name, I'm saying it because he's allowing me to swear here. So fuck up nice, huh? On, on, on the council chamber, sorry, fuck up nice. Huh? And, um, sorry? Is originally from Mexico? Okay, and, and Luz Dari, we may want to invite well. them and, and to the organizing committee to figure out how we establish a relationship with them. And if you need healers, by profession, I do that most of the time. And, uh, and uh, because we need to look at the emotional side, not only at the financial and administrative sites, which is where we most of the time focus our attention. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.